Hey everyone, this is Ross Ratty and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk all about fruits, vegetables, really uh, all kinds of weird interesting things in that little world. How to use it in the kitchen, how to grow it, um, you name it. And last week we talked a lot about how I would kind of approach the commercial fig industry. In this episode of Fruit Talk, we're actually going to talk a little bit more about figs on a, a different topic within figs and I want to mention a couple things that we kind of forgot in last week's episode uh, looking back on it um, watching it reading everyone's comments on last week um, there was a few things I just failed to mention and one is that I would if I was going to do this in a, a greenhouse setting um, under some kind of hoop house, whatever, you name it, um, I would definitely train them as a Japanese espalier where you have a nice little trunk that comes up from the ground and then that trunk is split up into two low growing cordons or arms, kind of like a grapevine, uh, maybe about you know two to three feet off the ground. Uh, my buddy Bass has that exact growing set up in his greenhouse and it's certainly a very productive and, and more manageable way to do it in a greenhouse setting because if we let these fig trees grow and grow and grow, you know, they'll get massive. And essentially with that way of pruning it, you just come back to the, the cordon every year, leave a certain number of nodes for new branches to form and you know, it's a, it's a pretty good way to do it. Uh, also the greenhouse that I was mentioning, the optimal greenhouse I should mention, is one that is like a wallapini. It's about three feet down, and um, you know, it's just uh, you can you can obviously add in those <clears throat> those pipes underground. There's a million ways to do it, but I think those are the two most biggest things that I mentioned. I'm sure I could really go on and on and on about it, but in this episode, I want to mention a couple things that are kind of going on in the greenhouse with the figs, and also talk a lot about how I'm planting about 50 varieties this year. Um, we're going to be planting 50 varieties of figs. We talked about that last year. I want to talk, I wanted today to touch on the varieties and why I've chosen these particular varieties. Talk about really some important things for me um, and people in colder climates that I think are just too important not to listen to. I'm, I'm going to be honest. Um, so, in the beginning here, this is what you're looking at here is a photo of my strawberry verte um, that was grafted last year, and this is in the greenhouse. It's awake. It's got probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about, I want to say, six inches of new growth. It's doing really well. In fact, a lot of the trees in the greenhouse you can see right here. Some of them have already put out a foot of growth. It's pretty insane. Um, I took a lot of photos, but um, not many of them came out too well, and it's not really visible in, unless you're really there in person. Even on video, I can't seem to get <laughs> really how uh, extraordinary the new growth is of the season. But um, in this particular photo, you can see that there's three Breva on the Strawberry Verte graph that we did and it's kind of amazing because I just I know strawberry verte puts out Breba but I've never seen Breba on the same two Brevas in the same node which makes me believe that this is actually one of them is a main crop that's overwintered and never ended up forming um, this is what my indeed my theory is because about 40 percent of my trees whether they're newly grafted varieties, young grafts, young trees, it doesn't matter how old they are. This is a pretty common thing that people will mention is that fig trees just do not put out a whole lot of Breva until they really mature. And I agree with that. But I don't really think these are Breva. I think these are overwintering main crop because even on varieties that are not really supposed to put out a Breva are putting out a Breva. It's really, really strange. And um, I think a lot of it has to do with the immense amount of growth we got last year. Things took a real long time to go dormant. And I would imagine some of these trees maybe had not really even gone fully dormant. I'm not sure. But what I do know 
is that all that new growth that we put on, there was a lot of figs that could have been induced if we had uh, pinched the tree. And we didn't end up pinching. I mean, some of them we did to really stop that growth and help them harden up in time. But uh, across the board, it's just very strange that a huge amount of my figs have Braba on them this year. It's really unbelievable. Um, normally, even if, you know, even I even pruned really hard. If you prune back the old growth that Braba forms on last year's wood, you know, you're not going to get that Braba production. It's kind of like if you had an apple tree and you pruned off all the spurs, you're just not going to get apples. So it's the same thing with the fig, and I really am just shocked. I can't. I can't believe it. Um, I've even pinched a couple trees in the greenhouse so far because we've gotten so much growth. And what that's been able to do is that we're going to get fruits pretty soon in a relatively um, short time. I'd say about because we pinched them maybe about seven, about a week ago or something like that. We're probably 90 days away from our first fruits of the year. That would put us in July. And uh, that's normally when I get my first figs with trees that are in the greenhouse getting a nice little early head start what really stinks is that i don't have an early variety in the greenhouse this year all the early varieties are underneath the sunroom and if i did have some early varieties like ronde bardot as an example or azores dark they would have put out fruit on their own i wouldn't even have had to pinch them and um, they would certainly have ripened by july 1st uh, but this year i should get fruit probably in early July off of from main crop that is off of sweet joy and also sandrosa as well as a whole host of different brevas from about 40 percent of my varieties it's really cool so we'll see what happens I may even get some breva in early June uh, what 90 days from today that puts us in all of April all of May and all of June so yeah it's we're looking at early July, and depending on when the tree woke up, depending on if the brave is maybe a bit early, we could be looking at sometime in mid-June, which would be pretty cool. And by then, usually in June and July, we have lots of heat, and that heat is um, really beneficial to ripening some high-quality fruit. Uh, maybe in sometime in June, the temperatures won't be too high, but certainly in early July, we had a heat wave last year that just... It gave me some really incredible quality on some of my figs uh, last year. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is what we mentioned before: is how I'm going to plant, how I'm going to be planting all of these fig trees this year. We're going to have somewhere around 50 varieties in total. Um, all in an effort. If you watched or listened to last year's or last week's episode of of Fruit Talk, it was all in an effort to try to get a lot of these varieties um, to, to be a commercial tree you know really try to get these trees going so that next year at this time I can be calling up some restaurants making contacts and really selling fruit to um, people in the Philadelphia area um, hopefully some restaurants higher-end places but also maybe some uh, places along the Italian market, maybe even some grocery stores. I'm not sure, but we're not going to have, I would expect, crazy production without a greenhouse. But um, certainly I can get these trees to put out, hopefully, some good quality fruit, get them over to these people, and they can hopefully process them in some way that um, would really uh, make something really interesting for them. So... Um, we did actually make a nice little blog post on how we're going to be planting these. We're also doing a whole video series on this. But if you want to check out the blog post we did, um, you can go to rossratty.wixsite.com slash blog, and that's where you'll find this, this blog post here that I'm looking at. Um, essentially, the whole goal is to build every single fig, build them a nice little mound. And the mound should be somewhere around, you know, maybe uh, two feet, three feet in diameter. And it's a foot high. And because it's so high, and because the fig trees are a bit elevated, their root balls are a bit elevated 
above grade, we're going to have a lot more heat during the earlier part of our season. And what I'm really imagining this to happen is going to be, I think, I'm, I'm actually, I, I'm, I'm a bit optimistic, but I really think my optimism is going to come mostly true in that a lot of my varieties are going to ripen for me probably in early August. Um, I am expecting a lot of these trees to replicate a container fig. That's really the goal of these in-ground trees is to make them as close to an in to as a con as a container fig as possible in terms of the amount of heat that it gets. That's the big advantage to having them in containers is that one you can move them wherever you want, but you also give them a really huge head start to the season. Because they have that huge head start to the season, um you're able to get fruit really early. We're talking like August 1st. And those are on the, the earliest varieties that exist. So if I can get these in-ground trees to be pretty close to that, I'm not expecting them to be exactly by August 1st. But if I can get that, or maybe even August 15th, um, mission accomplished. Because that's the goal, without a doubt. Um, I don't really know how much... I'm really going to put into winter protection. The ideal goal, I would say about a month ago before I realized that all of my trees had probably died back to the ground this year. Um, none of them really had survived except for Hardy Chicago, which I mentioned here in the blog post. Um, you know, finding a really hardy variety that will survive here with no damage is definitely a goal. But um, if that's not going to happen, so be it and the next form of action the next form of my focus should be dedicated to getting these fig trees to fruit from dieback at a very early time of the year before the before the fall rains come in in my climate and also um, the quality should be pretty high at that point um, what this is going to do is not only is it going to hopefully beat a container fig, um, but also give me just, you know, or I should say not only is it going to match a container fig, but hopefully it should beat one in the amount of production because it's in the ground. It should be a much larger tree. It has access to way more nutrients. Um, I could see myself, if this works out to my real goal here I could see myself having way less container figs in the future and that would be really a beautiful thing I have to say that would be a lot less work um, you know the container figs could be dedicated to very specific figs like ones that either fill a particular um, flavor category or they're very late in the season or you know they're there for a specific reason maybe I'm trialing them um, rather than having all these figs in containers for production purposes I could put all the production trees in the ground and that would be really really something so um, that's kind of what we're doing is that I took lots of soil temperature readings and these soil temperature readings all over the property, I've realized that the southern exposure has the warmer soil, obviously, then the southwest and then the west side of the property. This photo here was taken on the west side of the property. And wherever there's rocks, and this is why every, every mound is going to be covered in rocks or brick or some kind of stone, big boulders, you name it, um, is that it really increases the soil temperature by a crazy amount um, to the point where this is really what's mimicking a container is that the soil is getting really warm because the soil is so warm the metabolisms are really increasing and all that really high metabolism is going to put these trees into just a much better state than as if they were planted level in the ground with with grade or even below grade um, or even mulched. I really think we should get rid of a lot of the mulch that we have around our figs. They don't mind the drier soils. They don't mind uh, less fertile soils. Uh, the mulch really cools the soil down 
early in the spring and I think that really is what causing a lot of my trees to do almost nothing sometime around May they just do nothing for an entire month and it doesn't really they don't really do they don't really kick themselves into gear until I would say June and that's really just a bit of a shame because if they're only doing something till June then that's like pretty horrible you know that they're not really going to do a whole lot this year in that particular year it's going to be a struggle to get them the fruit you're not going to get that many fruits I've been doing it like that for years having all this layers of wood chips on top of my in-ground figs and the soil is just too cold I took the soil temperature reading like I was saying um, wherever there's bare soil compared to heavily mulched soil the mulched soil is about 15 to 10 degrees cooler than it is when it's just bare ground and this is of course when the Sun is shining um, but also uh, if you have rocks or some kind of black plastic boulders something on the ground that's going to act as a thermal mass that increases the soil temperatures by like another five degrees minimum so you're looking at between heavily mulched soil and soil covered with stone you're looking at about 15 degrees minimum and 15 degrees is massive for any any plant um, <clears throat> you know every plant every species has their own little temperature that they love to grow at that they're optimally grown at right figuring out what that temperature is is really a challenge Things like alliums, for example, can really grow well, believe it or not, throughout the wintertime here. And yeah, they're not going to put on a ton of growth, but a fig certainly is not going to grow very well at 60 degrees Fahrenheit at the soil level. You really need about 70 degrees to see some significant activity. Even 80 degrees is really when you start to see things go nuts. Um, so if I can get these temperatures way higher earlier in the season, that's where I'm thinking I'm going to be hitting that really nice timing early in the season. And that timing, like I said, is a big difference between ripening my fruits August 1st versus what they normally do is September 1st. And by the time it's September 1st, it's just, it's kind of almost over at that point, you know, depending on the, 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 the rain that year, you know, so this is really the only way I think that I can imagine myself ever growing figs here unprotected you know out in the open not in any sort of greenhouse this is the only way that I can think it's possible um, to get any sort of success and if I do get good success like I said it's gonna be quite a game changer um, now what varieties am I thinking about planting this is probably the most important thing of this episode for those of you guys who are growing lots of varieties of figs what we have here is a nice little map of kind of where the figs are going on the property um, so you can see that we've got lots of different areas here we have a, a bed by the greenhouse we have a bed by our south facing microclimate that's really nice we're adding another 22 varieties there um, we're also adding about three of them out front in completely out in the open um, every fig I have planted here has got some sort of thermal mass attached to it whether it's a berm a wall a house um, some kind of large mass of concrete whatever it is there's always something and out in the front this is where there's absolutely no protection at all and um, this is the location where I decided to put the hardiest of the varieties that I have in an effort to hopefully get these trees through the winter even though they're in a really exposed position we also have um, what were the raspberry and blackberry beds that raised bed there we're doing about three rows of them one along the house another row in behind the raised bed and then another row in front of the raised bed using that soil in the raised bed as a nice little thermal mass 
Um, we're also thinking about adding these two varieties. I have to somehow acquire them, but these I think could potentially do pretty well in the ground. Sangue Dulce being one that is definitely a hardy Chicago type. Um, and hardy Chicago seems to be the only one in, in the, the relatives of hardy Chicago that really seem to survive here, at least so far. I did have a um, white Marseille that survived here from edible landscaping. We planted that one, believe it or not, in a raised bed. Eight inches high, uh, eight inches of his, eight inches of its root ball was above grade. So that's pretty, pretty nuts. Um, I would say the south wall here. This is probably the most experimental varieties that I'm mentioning, and that I'm going to try. So I don't really know if any of these will work out at all. Some of these may be a bit too late. A lot of these are not very hardy, I imagine. Um, but what is known for sure, or which should be pretty reasonable, is that these should be varieties that ripen at a reasonable time and have at least good to very good rain resistance. So a variety here as an example like, uh, let's see, uh, something like Black Madeira KK is probably the worst of all of them. And some of these trees I'm planting in the ground for the purpose of selling cuttings from the tree. Um, these are not really going to be production trees. And it'd be nice if they were. It was a nice, it'd be a nice little bonus, but in terms of Black Madeira KK, I think my chances of getting high quality fruits off of that tree is pretty low. Um, so really just sticking it in the ground to get as many, as much growth as possible to then sell that as cuttings or plants um, come November. And we're doing this with a couple of varieties, but there is a lot of hope in here. This is not really just a, it is kind of like a big experiment, like Smith, you know, not supposed to be very hardy. The trace displace, I imagine, is not very hardy, but what is nice about it is that it fruits very early. It's super early. So it probably will die back, I imagine, every year. The rain resistance isn't that great, but because it's so early, I'll probably get fruits by August 1st. Um, we have La Bourgeoisie, which is hopefully, I'm, I'm thinking, is going to be a replacement to all of my Col de Doms. Uh, I think that's what I hope, is that it has a flavor similar to Col de Dom. And I may end up never replacing Col de Dom Blanc. Uh, Col de Dom Blanc is probably the, my favorite of the of the Col de Dom so far. It is my favorite of them so far. And because that fig is so good, I don't know if I could ever replace it. I don't know if there's ever going to be a fig that beats it. So it's tough to get rid of it. <laughs> but I am trying to find replacements for it. And La Bourgeoisie could be it. It's also quite rain resistant, and uh, if it's more along mid-season than in the late portion of the season, it may actually ripen here in the ground, hopefully by September. I think that the latest, I want every single one of these varieties here on this list to ripen by, the first fig should ripen by September 1st. If we're getting anything later than that, I'm going to eventually take it out, because it's just not, it's not going to work. Uh, with too much rain around September 15th and onwards. Borges Soak Reese and Violet Sapor, these are uh, great ones to choose from because they are indeed mid-season. They are quite tasty and they do hold up to the rain decently. They're not incredible, but um, you know, uh, I've heard reports that Borges Soak Grease is not very hardy. Um, I don't know. It's really a nice little experiment. San Baggio, this one is, uh, again, we don't know how hardy it is. And it's. Sh I've actually heard a report that it's not very hardy. There's very few people that even have this tree. But it is mid-season or early, early to mid. So we should be all right. We got Negra de Age, which is um, another fig similar to Col de Dom. But definitely mid-season and rain resistant. So we'll see about that one. Fico Rocco, this one is a new one. Don't know much about it. It's supposed to be relatively hardy and pretty early, so we'll see. Um, Neruciola de Elba, this one actually is a mid-season, holds up to the rain pretty decently, and um, 
hardiness is probably likely low because it comes from the island of Elba and Elba is a pretty warm place in Italy. La Magdalene, which is a, a nice little fig coming from uh, France out of Thierry's collection. This one has good rain resistance. It's very early, so this one probably is a good choice. Um, Col Noir, this one has got to be a great choice, particularly for container culture. This one's probably going to be on a lot of people's wish list coming up. This is going to be, I think, a real popular fig. And um, people keep saying, like, oh, I thought this hobby was over, right? But there's another fig that just keeps coming around the corner that's, like, you know, highly desired. And um, I think this one rightfully is highly desired. Like, this one is going to be a standard in almost every climate, I think. Um, it's really tasty for sure. It dries exceptionally well on the tree um, and it has amazing rain resistance more than almost You know probably 95% of the figs out there So we'll see about that one. I know it's a uh, about mid-season ish so Yeah, September 1st, right? Um, figure Jean this one is another one from France ripens as early as Ron de Bordeaux and to trace this place uh, Mazzanita and Rosa de Goni, these are trees that uh, look incredibly tasty and I'm kind of growing them for um, cuttings. Ashia Black, this is a really highly tasty fig that we found this one, or we managed to get this one from a French collection overseas and it was always thought by Herman in New Jersey, a guy who's really obsessed with figs in New Jersey, only 20 minutes away from me. Um, the backstory is that Aishia Black from UC Davis, there's a repository in California, and that's one of the figs from that repository that's exceptionally good. We know it comes from Europe, but all the figs at UC Davis got a horrible disease, fig mosaic virus, and some of them took it better than others, and Aishia Black was one that did not take it well. To the point where um, this tree actually had to be replaced at UC Davis, and a lot of people growing it had given up. I have the UC Davis version as well. We just we just got some this year. We're propagating some actually right over here to my left because um, it's so tasty. I imagine it's going to be in my top five of all figs that I I have, uh, at least for my climate. But Herman trialed it in ground for years and had very little success. And if he's having very little success, then I'm not going to have very good success. Um, you know, he's way ahead of me in terms of in-ground production. So I'm kind of just trying to copy everything that he's done um, in terms of uh, his in-ground methods. You know, he's no longer around. And you can't really get in contact with him, so you can't even really you can't even really ask him it's been a bit of a challenge and I've kinda just tried to mimic him as much as possible um, with my in-ground um, methods so but we found one from Europe that doesn't really have the disease or it does actually I've seen it because um, we're propagating it as well but it's nowhere near as bad and um, I just expect big things. I mean, if that was the big issue Herman said with the variety was the disease. So now that this one doesn't have the disease nearly as much, um, you know, I may actually be able to grow this one in ground. And this may actually be able to be much more standardized and easily propagated among the fig community than the UC Davis version. And this one could eventually phase the UC Davis version out completely. Um, who knows? And we also put in Smith we mentioned. We we're testing out the hardiness. Uh, it is mid-season and it, is good. it has really great rain resistance so um, even if it gets killed every year it should come back and should put out fruit for us sometime in September. This is Iraqi, an actual Ficus palmata hybrid between Ficus carica and Ficus palmata. Pretty cool. There's not many of them out there that exist, but I think actually Golden Rainbow could be one of them. And it seems like Golden Rainbow and Iraqi are putting out fruit extremely early. 
Um, I know Golden Rainbow, according to Ben B in Seattle, if you guys watch his YouTube channel, he says to me that uh, it ripens alongside Ron de Bordeaux. Propagating them here in the closet, there's very few figs that are actually putting out fruit at such a small size at a, at a young age. These are two of them that are. Another ones that are are Azores Dark and Black Madeira. And those four I would consider to be some of the most precocious varieties that exist. They put out fruit very, very easily. So for that particular reason, I'm not entirely sure if Iraqi is even going to live. Um, it may just be because it's a hybrid, it's not very hardy at all. And even it may even die. Uh, <laughs> if we may, we're probably going to plant this particular one a bit deep. And by planting it deeper, we're going to ensure that it survives, hopefully. But we don't know what the hardiness is of it, so who knows? But the thing is certainly puts out figs like no other. I mean, it's that got that Palmata gene in it, and I have another fig here that my buddy Simon got to me from his home in Iraq. Or I'm sorry, it's a... Oh, Simon, don't kill me. I think it's... Is it northern Iran? Oh man, it's either Iraq or Iran, but it's in a very mountainous region. You can see it here. This one's also, I believe, to be a Palmata hybrid. I could be wrong about this one too, but it's got the same weird little um, fruiting habits that Iraqi does. It's got similar leaf pattern. I think there's something there with those, so we'll see. This is uh, Blanche de Du Cezanne, which is from Michael Grace's collection. Uh, Michael Grace has now passed. He was a big grower in Virginia, and um, you know, may he rest in peace. But this was, he didn't really want it to be hyped up, and he didn't want it to go for crazy prices. But this was his favorite fig, other than I think the Col de Dames. And rightfully so. I got to taste it last year, and um, I even did a video of it with Big Bill. Maybe you guys saw it. But this one um, is the the closest fig to jam that I've ever tasted. It really tasted just like jam. Um, it's really weird. Uh, Thermalito, this one's from Doug. and Doug actually, this is like his earliest or one of his earliest figs. And if it's early in California, that really is kind of saying something. Um, even though it doesn't always translate over, but if it's really early in California, or if it's really early in Spain, or really early in Italy, you can almost guarantee that it's going to ripen here by the middle of the season. So I think Thermalito is probably a good choice. Also really tasty. And then there's also White Madeira, which comes from Maryland, and between Blanche de Du Cezanne, Thermalito, White, White Madeira, I'm going to have a really nice collection of these Adriatic types in the ground. I'm also doing St. Martin, which um, is supposed to be the hardiest fig that exists. St. Martin's quite similar to probably these three, as well as Gayette, which we'll get into in just a moment. Um, there's also the Dalosa, which is from the Belfiore collection. Belfiore Nursery believes it to be the original Daloso depicted in Galicio's drawings, but I don't know if that's really true, and um, it doesn't really matter because the fig seems to be quite tasty, and it's early, at least early to mid-season, and it's definitely rain-resistant. Along the greenhouse on the west side, it's probably going to be my worst my worst planting site other than out in the front, which is completely out in the open. Um, this one's probably next, and we're going to plant things like Demos Family Unknown, which is from my buddy uh, Raphael. It was an unknown that's been living in New York, I think maybe in the, in the Bronx or Brooklyn somewhere. It's been there for years. It's huge. Um, also very early. And then there's also Gayette, which we mentioned. This is a French fig that resembles Dalmaty, but it's better. We have White Triana, which uh, over the years have really grown to like, and it's got a real thick and jammy interior that it's hard to beat. I don't know why I wanted to put this one in the ground because um, it really takes a long time to ripen. We're talking about you know somewhere in the neighborhood of 
10 days at least before I would consider it perfect. And having a fig in the ground that takes that long to ripen to perfection is a bad idea because there's a lot of things that can happen in that 10 day window. So we'll see what happens with it. And maybe if the in-ground situation that it's in may change that around a bit. I'm not sure, but we have an extra tree of it. So I think I'll, I'll stick it in the ground and uh, you know, why not? It's certainly a tree worth propagating. So um, if it gets big, which it will, I can always dig it up, put it in a pot and have another one. I mean, it's really, really good. This is my best replacement so far for any of the cold adams. Pretty, it's pretty close. Very thick, gooey, jammy interior. We also have Pastelliere in three different forms here. One from an Italian source, one um, called Constans, which comes from France, another one from um, a conservatory in France that uh, actually the Aishia Black comes from that same conservatory as well. So these should be some really old, perhaps even um, slightly different versions of Pastelliere, which is the end, of, the end goal to try to find different strains of it. Some that hopefully are better and I can then propagate from that one tree. Uh, we have one from Rain Tree Nursery you can get here in the United States, which is easier to find. Um, and that one, it seems to drop a lot of figs at a young age. So we're really trying to eliminate that dropping if, it, if we can. Um, you know, and I'm sure there's a strain out there that doesn't have that dropping. Or if it does, it's very minimal. And if that's the case, um, that's the one I want to propagate from. Also, we have a fig here called Campanieri. This is a French fig that's very old outside of uh, the Paris region, I think, of France. It survived really cold temperatures, negative four degrees Fahrenheit in 2012, I think it was. Which year was it? Um, but uh, Thierry was telling me that uh, that's what that fig has survived and it didn't have really much damage at all, which is really incredible. Um, that's unheard of. Hardy Chicago would probably take damage or even die completely to the ground at that temperature. So this fig's potentially even more hardy than Hardy Chicago. Really cool. So that's why we have a lot of them. If you can see here, we've got like four or five of them that I'm gonna plant. Um, some out in the open, some in different locations, really get an idea of just how hardy it is. We're also planting, we've already planted actually Azores Dark. Um, it's a hardy Chicago type for sure. It seems to be much tastier in my opinion and very early and very precocious. So it should be an overall winner here for sure. I don't know if I'm going to get the same quality off of the tree because it's in the ground. Um, you know that fruit quality may suffer because of some excess water. You know you can really control the water that gets into your pots, and if you do that, you're looking real pretty with the fruit quality. We've also got a fig here called Green Michurinska that's been coming into the U.S. for a couple years now, I think. This one comes from Bulgaria. It's an unknown there that's huge. And it's from a zone 6A or 6B, 6B, 7A climate, I think, in Bulgaria, which is a climate, I think, that's even slightly colder than mine. I'm not sure, but this one's huge there. So this is a real proven winner. Um, already uh, should be a large tree, should be very early. It's a, a super early tree fig it's you know I think it's it ripens probably alongside Ron de Bordeaux which I use as the standard to compare to uh, we've also got white Marseille we talked about this one long to do this one is a super hardy variety very early overall an incredible winner for an in-ground choice LSU Huye this one's got a unique flavor profile and to be honest with you uh, it's pretty early very rain resistant. Um, we don't know the hardiness. Negretta, this is a little seedling uh, that Sergio Carlini had brought into the US. Well, I don't know if he brought it in, but 
it basically it came from him and uh, you know at some point and um it made its way into the u.s about 10 years ago and this one's been proven by herman specifically to do really well in my climate uh Nerino, aka moro di caneva this is one of the oldest figs in italy and it's very tasty very hearty um this one's an overall absolute champion i think it may even i have a feeling it's going to compete with campaneri and hardy chicago it's a very old variety that has adapted over the years it's really well really something you should look for stallion aka blue celeste this is a strain of blue celeste blue celeste is very hardy very rain resistant very early Vertolino, this one I think is probably the same as or very similar to Fico Salam or Fico Salame. <laughs> it's um, a green small fig from Italy that is teardrop shape, kind of like a Celeste almost, but not so much uh, of a long stem or a long neck. But it's really good actually, and it's quite early, very early, and uh, should be a nice little winner here. We'll see. Zafiro, this one I have high hopes for because it's very rain resistant. I think it's somewhere between early and mid-season. We're not sure, but a lot of these I'm unsure of really the hardiness, you know. We'll have to kind of see what ends up actually surviving, but I guess if one tree were to survive out of all of these, that would be inevitably be the king, but it would be nice to have a, a good mix of these, these figs to have pretty decent production from a, a, a you know, wide variety of varieties, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Uh, Taramo Unknown, you know, this one comes from Maryland. It's a huge tree there, should be a no-brainer. Simon Unknown, we talked about that. Confeji Black, this one is a local variety in Hungary that um, is quite hardy and quite early, so we should be pretty good with that. We have should have a a better chance than most with that one I think LSU champagne this is another Louisiana State University bred fig quite hardy believe it or not maybe not to zero we'll have to find out but definitely early and definitely rain resistant Brianzolo Rosso this is a one of the earliest if not the earliest figs in Italy um, very tasty fig too it's got like a nice little creamy interesting flavor profile I have a strong hunch that this is the same fig as Zafiro. We'll see. Black Greek. And this is from uh, my buddy Dennis in um, the Carolina Carolina area. He um, has been growing this one for a couple years, and he says it's an early black Madeira that's hardy. Pretty awesome. Black Celeste. And we're also going to plant in the same hole not just Black Celeste, but another fig called Violette de Marseille, which is Black Celeste. And I think this was the original name for Black Celeste in France before it was brought to the United States, probably over 100 years ago, I would imagine. Um, so interesting, 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 but uh, we'll see if they are indeed the same or if one of them performs a bit better, one of them maybe tastes better, and if there is a better selection there. I'll just take the other one out. Barb alone is showing good hardiness, good traits. Um, it's like a black white Marseille or a black Laterula. It's very strange. Um, people believe that it was an adapt or a, some kind of mutation, and the skin turned black on white Marseille, and that's what you end up with. Is Barb alone? Um, we're also going to put in the ground Noir de Boulogne. And Noir de Boulogne is very popular in France, highly regarded, well documented. I mean, the, the secrets, there's no real secrets with this one. It is quite hardy. It is about mid-season, and it's very tasty. Um, this one is the one that does not produce a Brava, I believe. Whereas Sultane is the one from France that's similar to Boulogne, hardy, rain-resistant, but Sultane, I believe, does produce a Brava. Regardless, if they do produce Brava, I'm going to remove the Brava and just um, get main crop from the both of them because they are just very tasty figs. Um, and that Brava is going to 
kind of delay that main crop. Another fig called Soban Blue Green from Harvey's collection, I think very much so resembles Balone. And um, we're going to put them again in the same hole, see which one does better, see if they are in need the same. Etc. We're going to also do Colonel Littman's Black Cross and Black Madeira Knot to see if they are indeed the same. Similar story there. Uh, Colonel Littman's has a real high shot at being one of those later season figs that can earn a position here uh, in ground and really stay here. I think this is one of them I have really high hopes for because it's quite hardy. Um, not only is it quite hardy, but um, it's got good rain resistance, a flavor that's very equivalent to Black Madeira, and uh, it's mid-season. You know, it's definitely mid-season. It's not, it's not too late, and it's basically a, a better Black Madeira. What I'm probably inevitably going to do is get rid of all my Black Madeira trees if the flavor of Colonel Littman's is indeed what I think it is and comparable I think we will probably inevitably get rid of Black Madeira as crazy as that sounds. Lampira 1 um, this is another one from France that is showing great rain resistance um, I think it's a bit late in the season though it's more in the mid to late region so we'll see. Pissoluto um, this one is a nice little Italian fig that uh, my buddy Dennis believe it or not in the Carolinas was telling me that this one does well for him so he recommended this one it's also a real tasty fig we've also got Ron de Bordeaux that's a no-brainer although a bit you know a bit difficult in the rain it can split for sure similar to like the trace displace and um, what's another one that's real early but can split um, those are the two that are really coming to mind right now uh, we've also got St. Martin. We mentioned how hardy that one is. And then the last thing here is Texas BA1, which is, according to Edible Landscaping, hardy in Zone 7 if you protect it from the wind. I don't know how much I really put value into the wind because I have uh, wilt proof. It's going to stop that desiccation from happening. But um, I don't know. It, it really depends. And I... It, a lot of people say that Smith is the same thing as Texas BA1, but that's certainly not the case. They're very different. They are different figs. Not very different, but they are different figs. And the fact that it's similar to Smith, you know, that should be something we should look at. This may actually be a better strain of Smith, potentially, because it is indeed hardy. Um, and then lastly, like I said, we're trying to find Sangua Dulce and Calderona. Calderona is another one from Ponza's collection that is showing pretty good. It's ripening at a reasonable time of the year, but the, the length of time from the first fig to the last fig seems to be a bit long, according to Pons. So maybe this one's not a great choice, but the rain resistance is pretty decent as well. I'm not sure. I think it's worth trialing. Um, but I, I inevitably think in this little category that Colonel Littman's is going to beat them all out. So we'll see. But um, yeah, that was this episode of, uh, of Fruit Talk, guys. This is the end of the list. Somehow we're going to have somewhere in the neighborhood of like 50 or more varieties in total. Um, this is how we're planting them, right? We talked all about that. We talked about what's going on in the greenhouse. We did talk a little bit about the commercial production in the beginning. Um, this was a long one, so if you guys got this far, I appreciate it. Hopefully a lot of you guys at this point, if you're watching this on iTunes, it's not entirely on iTunes at the date of filming this, but uh, very soon it's coming. It is actually coming. I've been saying this for weeks, for months, but um, this will indeed be on iTunes very soon, and if you are listening to this on iTunes, Hopefully this one was a nice little video for you or podcast to listen to on your commute or something like that. And um, this one filled that nice little gap of entertainment for you. All right. I also want to recommend follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Check out the website, rossratty.wixsite.com slash blog. And if you guys really want to support me, um, you know, like the videos on YouTube, subscribe on YouTube, and also um, – 
think about supporting us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Ross Ratty. Any little bit certainly is going to help. And, uh, yeah, let's have a great season this year of Growing Figs. All right, everyone. Take care, and I'll see you next week for the next episode.